Here it comes, sour mash. We're going to talk about that today, and we're going to run this. Come all you moonshiners if you want to hear About the kind of bull that they serve around here Made way back in top of them hills Where they plenty of moonshiners Well, as always, we welcome you back well, to Barley and Hops. I'm George, and for all of you returnees, welcome. If you're new, please subscribe. Click the icon, the bell icon, and get updates every time. Don't miss an episode. Okay, um... We're working today on the explanation of sour mash. Uh, I'm actually going to run one today. I have a sour mash in here, um, and I'm going to tell you how I did all that. I'll draw it out for you so that's real simple and straightforward. Uh, plus, I want to introduce you to something else here that I've, I, I've used these oodles and oodles of times. Uh, instead of a PID this time, um, I'm going to use a pulse width modulator. Okay? And uh, what I've got here is just got this, this is my small speakeasy still, uh, and I've got one roll of copper I put in the column for those of you who are convinced we got to have copper, okay? It's there, just, it's there. Okay, and uh, of course, I'm going to run through here, and then this is my output. Now, I've got cold water that goes in the bottom of my condenser, comes out the top, and I did not hook up the reflux chamber because I want the flavors, so... I'm going to run it without reflux. I've got a thermometer here, and I already had this preheated a little bit, and right now that kettle is, the top of this kettle is 138.9 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is 59.3 degrees centigrade. And my head temperature at my point of no return right now is 79.8, or 26.6 Celsius. So, what have we got to do here? I, let me turn this on because what a pulse width modulator does is it will take, uh, see you can hear that running. What it does is it takes the energy that's coming in, the sine wave of energy coming in, and then it's going to convert it to a square wave and then resend it out. Uh, based on what you select, to send it out at an appropriate level. Gosh, it, to, to, to be simple, really what I can do is I can use this knob and I can adjust. See, right now I'm at 67 volts and 9 amps. I can turn it up and I'm now at 113 volts or 115 volts, 16 amps. See, and that's a 2,000 watt element on 120 volts, so what do we normally pull? 16.6 amps with that. So now I'm at 17, 16. So I've got this, I just added this on here just so that I could track it. Now, oh, I had this hooked up earlier, I had it on one of my 15 amp circuits, and guess what? <coughs> yep, it blew it. Yep, so it tripped the breaker, I had to move it to another circuit. So that's for all of you out there who, remember if it's, if, if it's, okay. Plain and simple. We overloaded the circuit. Now, but now we got it running right, okay? So um, we're going to let this continue to run while we move over to the board, and we're going to talk about sour mash, and at the same time, we're going to be running this throughout the rest of the day. I have my cooler uh, over top with my air conditioner on top. That's my cold water, and that's 55 degrees, and all I got to do now is just plug in the water pump, put my collection jar out, we're about to step into the world of sour mash. So, sit back and get ready, let's do it. Sour mash is a style of distilling that has matured over a period of time. Um, now, there's three ways to make a sour mash, right up front, okay? But I want you to start to think of this too now. Consider um, a sourdough bread. If you recall how that was made in your home or, or how that is made in general. And that is, they'll take some flour and everything, they'll mix everything together for a bread, bread dough, um, that is allowed to set aside and begin to sour. Um, go putrid, uh, you, use whatever words you want for it, but it, will, it tends to go sour. Um, now, what happens is, is that a fresh ball of dough is made, and then a portion of that sourdough is chopped off 
and introduced into the new bread dough. And once that's all matched together, then they do they go through the same process of making bread anyway, leavening bread, you know, letting it rise. That's how they make sourdough. Now, when we make a sour mash, we have three different options. And I'll cover the one that's the, the most simple one first, the one that I like to use. Um, and then there are two other methods. It, one of them is a commercial method. So uh, the one that I like to use is, is as follows. Oh, boy. And that's actually what I have running here. You can see that's still running. Um, still tracking. Yeah, but 51 volts, it's 7 amps. So I'm just going to let that set and run. It's running just a little slow, but I'm, I'm okay with that. <clears throat> now, what happens is, and I think you can recall back when I made that barley, corn, um, rye mash, um, and, and I said, I said, remember I even said on that video, I said, oh, this would be great for a sour mash. So, and I did, I set it aside. What I did was I took all of the liquid out and I left just the grains that I had already extracted everything I thought I was going to extract from them. And of course, you'll never get to that 100%, but for the sake of argument, everything was out of them. Uh, so what I did was I put those in a bucket, put the lid on it, and I just set that outside, just let it sit there for well, about three or four days. And lo and behold, that mash started to, I, I like to call it putrefy, but not, not actually putrefy. It's, uh, it started to go sour. You know, other bacteria were in there and they started growing. Now what happens to that? Uh, the same thing happens in the stillage which is the leftover liquid from distilling that's in your kettle, okay? Um, or the barm, okay, that barm, you know that nasty stuff at the bottom of your fermenter that settles out, okay? So yeah, we call that barm in distilling, uh, we call it lees in uh, wine making, and we call it trub in beer making. They're all the same thing, is that it's actually yeast excrement, dead yeast cells and other byproducts. That's all it really is. Uh, so. We have that. Now, in all those cases, what happens is, is that as that grain sets there and starts to go off, um, it starts to form some long fatty chains, which is good. And then with the leftover residual sugars and stuff in here, that it starts to develop some lactic acid. Um, and that lactic acid starts a little bit of a minor fermentation process, okay? And what that does is that makes the environment very, very rich to ward off any other bacteria. And guess what? It also will have an effect to lower your pH because it will become acidic. Now, here's what you do, or here's what I do anyway. Since I take my next batch, and of course you go into all you do all the things you're going to do you know you're going to heat your water up you're going to add your grains whatever your grain bill may be um, i'll take two to three pounds of these grains and i'll introduce them into that new batch i'll put all these grains in here and i'll introduce that into here and then mix it all up add my yeast and allow that to ferment now that's known as a sour mash uh, because I've used the former two to three pounds. Three pounds is a good, a, a, a good, I guess, rule of thumb. Okay. Now, that works extremely well. And then, of course, after all of this ferments, I just remove all the water, leave the grains behind. Guess what I got? I've got something left. I've got all the grains, but remember, I've got that barm down here now. That's the next method. The next, so that's method number one. Method, let's, we'll do this. Method number two would be to start a new fresh batch and take all of this barm out and collect it, save it in a jar or wh wherever you're going to save it into. And then when you get ready to make this next batch, do the same thing except for this. You just skip that part and you fill it with all your grains, you take this barm and you introduce that into there. Now what does that provide? That prov Yeasts are also cannibalistic. 
uh, and they will eat other dead yeast cells. And the reason they'll eat those dead yeast cells because the leftover nutrients and the amino uh, acids and those things that are left over in the dead yeast. It, and so they will eat that. Um, so that goes in there. And then you add your fresh yeast on top and you let that ferment. Now that becomes another form of a sour mash. Hmm. Yeah. Now I know the question is going to come up, George, well if I take this barm and throw it in here, is there not yeast in here that are going to probably take, yeah they will, but remember yeast has two lifespans. Okay. Yeast have a chronological life and a reproductive lifespan. Okay? So what that means is that there, there's a certain time limit that a yeast cell can survive and live before it just dies off. Um, but before that will happen, it will usually go through its reproductive life cycle. It, its reproductive life cycle is about anywhere between 18 and 22 daughter cells that it produces. And if you get a really close look at a yeast cell, you can see the marks on the side where it's produced and it's butted off a daughter cell. So after about 20, most of the time it's, it's up to about 22. After about 22, then the yeast has, it's lived its useful purpose and it dies off and sinks down to the bottom and becomes food for other yeasts. So you've got a lot of these in here and you do have some yeast, but your fresh yeast will take over. Okay, well, we're getting at it now. Okay, now the third way of making a sour mash, and this one's actually a controlled method, and it's used by many, many distil distillers um, and uh, uh, distilleries uh, in order to make a sour mash. And it's the most popular, and this one's number three. And this is more, again, more in line with your commercial distiller, or you can do it at home too. You'll take, uh, it, here, it, this is our still. We're just going to draw something like that. There's our column, you know, and our, you know, our evaporator and all that stuff. And once we've finished distilling, you're going to have a certain amount of liquid left in here. You know, I'm surprised at the number of people that call and want to know why there's liquid left in there. Oh. Uh, you're not, when you distill, when you separate, you know, you, you only have a certain percentage of it is alcohol and you're separating that out. You're leaving everything else behind. Uh, well, you're going to have that much left behind. Let's say, for instance, you have five gallons and you're able to get three quarters of a gallon of moonshine out of it. What do you got left? Four gallons and one quarter. <laughs> or just about four gallons. <laughs> so what they'll do is they'll take this. Now, you know what this is rich and full of? Oh, yes, esters. Um, oh gosh, uh, dead yeast cells because you've really heated them up. So all that dead stuff, um, the esters, the oils, the uh, fusel oils, all those flavors, that, that's all that's left in here. So in the next batch that is put together, 25% of this, and that's the the industry standard, and oh by the way, it's the requirement in order to be labeled as a sour mash. This much of all of this goes in here, and then they fill it up with fresh mash. And now what this does, again, you've got long fatty chains, okay, you've got dead yeast cells, you've got a lot of those flavors, those esters that are in there. This does two things. One, it feeds, but it also allows you to have consistency over bottle to bottle to bottle and batch to batch to batch. And that's the end of a sour mash. So you've got those three methods. Remember, you can sour your grain that you've already fermented or, um, yeah, that you've already fermented. You just set them aside and let them sour, just like you would do sourdough. That's one method. Uh, it works extremely well. My, that's my preferred method because um, you're reusing something. Uh, you can use the barm that's left over from the fermentation. 
Um, yeah, someone's going to write in. Can you do both at the same time? <laughs> yeah, I would imagine you could. Use the sour grains and then use some barm left over. Um, or the third method, which is really the commercial method, is using stillage back set whatever's left over in the still after you've finished the stilling. Does that all make sense? I mean, it kind of wraps it all together, and it's just, believe it or not, it's very straightforward, but it's a very, very precise um, method. Remember, principles and process remain the same. This becomes a technique or a method. I hope that clears up all of that for you. I enjoy doing that. Um, again, this is uh, our sour mash that's running, and I am right now almost at two full quarts. Uh, I will check back, and I'm just going to let this one run and finish up. You, you don't need to see all the rest of that, because all I'm going to do with that now is, see, this could be my sour mash whiskey. Uh, I will cut, age, and condition that, and I'll use, you know, again, American white oak. Uh, and I'll use the medium toasted chips uh, and get a really good flavor profile in there. Going, oh, you know, it, it, then of course I'll store it in a barrel. Happy distilling.